We are on lesson number three, Man's Origin and Nature. Uh, tonight is our fourth week of uh, classes, I believe, right? So let's begin with a word of prayer. Lord, again, we, we thank you for the opportunity to learn and grow in you. Uh, we thank you for these, uh, these great doctrines that, that we have the privilege of handing, handling and, and uh, we have to trust in you to, to reveal to us the things we need to know and to, to help us to be at peace those things that we just can't know. Uh, we trust you with those and we ask that your spirit would be our teacher today and we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, so um, we are, in, in terms of talking about man's origin, there's workbooks there, if you guys want to, you might want to look on one. Got it. Okay. Yeah. yeah um, I've committed the holding of memory. I, I, I knew you had, but uh, I don't know that he's had that opportunity. So. Um, we're on page uh, 16 on the third lesson. And we're going to start with uh, uh, talking about creation, and uh, rather than do the what do you think that, unless any of you need any insights into those, we're going to we're going to jump over those. And uh, uh, if the, if you look on page 17, you see there uh, at the top in the bold print. Uh, the universe was originally formed by God's direct act out of nothing, without use of any pre-existent material. So here is the term, and it, it, it's a Latin term. I'm not trying to impress you with Latin. I don't know Latin. I just know some theological terms in Latin. But if you ever saw it, I want you to, to be able to know what it is. And it's X nihilo and uh, all that you know nihilism nothingness so out of nothing is what that that term means um, and why why would that be important that uh, that that be a part of the doctrine that uh, when God created, he did it out of nothing. What are the alternatives, and what's what's the problem with any of the alternatives? If there was something that came from somewhere, where did it come from? Right. Okay, where did it come from? All right. And this is this is saying nope. There, you know, when in the beginning there was there was nothing. Mm. So it wasn't as though he he took. A, he found some, you know, a big blob of mud or fire or anything like that and said, I'm going to make this into a world and, you know, throw some stars out here or whatever. In fact, how, what, the way he created was, as our confession of faith says, by the word of his power. Mm. He spoke, boom. That's, that's how he created. So... Um, it, it's important in so that we we don't have to come up with some kind of a, a a theory that there was all you know things have always existed and you know and then they they evolved to some kind of universe that somehow evolved into something else and then life came and and so on um, you know people believe that but the scripture. Uh, indicates that's not how it how it happened. So out of nothing, by the word of his power, these are these are keys. If if somebody says, what do you what do you believe about creation? These are things that are um, that I would say if somebody asked me, what's your your view of creation? God created out of nothing by the word of his power mm -hmm. and all for his own glory. Mm -hmm. That's the, you know, the final aspect, that, that everything he created was to bring him, him glory. 
which if, if that was me doing that, then you'd say, well, you know, you're full of pride. Well, that would be, but not for God. Mm -hmm. he, he has the right to create and uh, do so for his purposes. So um, we're going to look very briefly, because I want to spend more time on, on the fall, <laughs> but we're going to look very briefly at uh, uh, some of the different views of creation. Uh, while those who accept the authority of the Bible commonly agree that God sovereignly made the world out of nothing, there it is, there are many different views concerning the exact meaning of the days of creation. Now, I, I, don't, I don't want you to be shocked by this. Sometimes people are, uh, and they think, well, wait a minute, a day is, is 24 hours, and there's no other acceptable view. The Bible says a day, a day is 24 hours, so if you say it's anything other than that, you must not believe the Bible. That's, that's not actually the case. In fact, in our, our, our denomination, and, and our denomination is faithful to the Scripture, um, the, at least two of these views are, are very prevalent. I'll tell you where I come down at, at, at some point if you want to know. Um, and so there are three views here. Uh, the short day, young earth, I'll ex explain these a little bit. Um, the uh, long day, old earth, uh, and then the literary framework theory. Now, um, I don't know how many years ago now, it's been, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago, we had some debates in our denomination about uh, whether anything other than six 24-hour day uh, views were, uh, would be acceptable or if you didn't hold to that, did you need to take an exception to our confession of faith? So we had a, a big debates over this at the General Assembly level, the Presbytery levels, and, and so on. And we came down with saying there are other acceptable views that are considered orthodox. You can be a PCA pastor and uh, an officer and hold to these other views. So. Um, I just want to assure you that even though um, you may not have heard these before, um, you, you can consider them. Uh, in our church, it's, it's not an issue. I mean, you can hold to any of these views. What I just told you is, is what we encourage people to hold to, that it's, you know, um, he, <coughs> he created in the space of six days. <clears throat> we usually say that, but that's not even defining what the day is, okay? Um, so let's look at these, and maybe maybe it'll make a little more sense in a minute. The first one, view one, short days, uh, young earth. Um, and that's basically where it says evening and morning are regular days. So you go to Genesis, and it says uh, um, the Hebrew word under 1a says the normal meaning of the word yom, that's the Hebrew word, uh, day in the Bible refers to a 24-hour period. I don't, I don't disagree with that. Um, that would be a, a normal reading of the word yom. It can mean other things, as we'll see in a minute, but um, it's not a stretch at all to, to say, well, the normal reading, unless you have some other reason to hold to something else, the normal reading is it's talking about a 24-hour day. And then those who hold to this would say the expression morning and evening points to exact time periods. So, you know, we, we know what a morning is, we know what an evening is, that sounds like a normal 24-hour cycle of, of a day, day and night. Um, the third thing, this is interesting, um, <coughs> Uh, God is able to create in such a way to give the appearance of age. For example, Adam was created full-grown, mature, when only a minute old. Now, the reason those who hold to this uh, uh, young earth uh, perspective and uh, saying that it was 24-hour days and so on have to hold to this idea that 
he must have created with the appearance of age is because you know you got archaeologists and others that are dating rocks and saying, wait a minute, this, this is more than you know five thousand years old, you know, and they they'll t mm -hmm. tell you millions of years ago, you know, this rock is that old. We can tell from science and so on. Well, you know whether whether um, uh, this isn't necessarily my preferred view, but I will say. Look, if God wanted to create in 24 hours, he can do that. And there's no problem with saying he can create with uh, the appearance of age. It, Adam is one example. The other example that I like to use is when Jesus did his first miracle and he changed water into wine. What kind of wine was it? Good wine. It was the good stuff, okay? And so, it, 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 uh, you know, the best wine wasn't made one second ago, <laughs> you know, it's aged. Mm -hmm. So when Jesus created, he created with the appearance of age. So that's not a stretch for him, it's not deceptive, it's just something that he can do if he, if he chooses to do it. And by the way, if somebody says, well, how could you create in 24 hours? Well, you know, how can you create? Can you <laughs> period. <laughs> but then the other thing is, uh, he didn't need 24 hours. He could have, as some theologians said, he could have done it in a nanosecond. Boom. You know, he didn't need 20. It wasn't like he's saying, oh, i got to really hurry up. My day's almost over and got all these things to make today. <laughs> you know, that's, that's just not how, how it w was necessary. Um, then the D, uh, and this is their argument that that yom must mean 24 hour days. The context of the chapter does not force yom to mean anything but a day of ordinary length. So, uh, and then E, in uh, our one and seven Sabbath day falls on God's actual one and seven creation rest day while looking forward to the eternal Sabbath. So that's, that's basically, um, if, if you want to say he created six 24-hour days, I would say that maybe a majority of our pastors hold to that. Um, probably most hold to that. And I would say the vast majority of church members in the PCA would hold to that. Um, so let me, let me give you, a, uh, let, let me just go ahead and say also that the third view here, I'm not even going to, talk to you about the literary framework theory. You can study up on that if you want. The reason I'm not going to talk to you about it is I've never understood it. So I can't even explain it to you, even with their explanations. Um, and there are others that are like that, though, that still hold to the Word of God being inspired and infallible. That's the key. I mean, uh, you know, some people might say, no, it wasn't 24 hour days because God couldn't do it because they want to undercut the authority of the scripture. The second view, that is not the case. Um, and if I have any leanings, it's probably toward this second view, but don't let that upset you. <laughs> Once in a while, somebody will go, what? I always trusted you more than that. Um, but uh, let, me, let me explain this uh, long day, or some call it the day age theory. And by the way, that, that's, that's what it is. Um, I would not stake um, my ordination on this. I would not stake, I wouldn't bet you $10 on this. You know, that, uh, I just, it, it just makes sense to me. Um, and it is within the pale of orthodoxy and uh, an acceptable view. So that's where I am on it. So I don't get bent out of shape if uh, somebody says, well, I, I hold to the 624-hour day. I say, Good, that's fine. My wife probably holds to the 24-hour day, you know. I'm sure my parents did, I guarantee. Okay, so here's, here's the day-age theory. Uh, the word for day is sometimes used in the Bible to indicate an age or era of time. Mm -hmm. So the word yom can mean like a, an, uh, a long period of time. Mm -hmm. Doesn't always mean that. Sometimes it means a 24-hour day, but it can mean that. So put that with the fact that geological makeup of our world would seem to indicate longer periods of information, uh, of formation rather, than a space of six days. 
the chronology of Genesis 1 is accurate and gives us the exact order of what God did in six consecutive periods. Mm-hmm. Now again, I, I'm, I, I would not take this position just because I would say, well, we got to make it fit with what science is saying. That's not a good reason, good enough reason in my view. It happens to fit with what science has is saying, but but that's not you know a good enough reason to to uh, to take or to come up with some theory saying well we got to explain this and make it fit with science. I, my view is you you let science fit with the scripture. Start with the scripture. So um, in in Genesis uh, two four this is two b. How long a period of time is referred to? It says uh, uh, a day, but the word is yom. And so basically that could be as long as it took to, for God to create the world. Mm. As long as he took. And by the way, remember, he's not, he's not bound by time either. Mm. So, you know, he, it's not like he had his watch on and was... We're saying, bound by time. Uh, we are. Not we are. Even. Yeah, Us. we are temporarily. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so the the question here: Does this prove that the other uh, that uh, the other days the day encompasses are also days that encompass a number of other days or years? And the author here would basically say, No, that doesn't doesn't prove that. Um, in Zechariah four is a place where the word Yom clearly is talking about a period of time or an era. Um, uh, that Second Peter one. So, when we talk about uh, in E, the first three days of creation took place before the formation of the sun and the moon. This is part of the uh, the long or the day age theory or the uh, the long day theory, um, and that is that. Uh, you know, what, what is a, a day? It's 24 hours, it's one trip around the sun. But if there wasn't a sun, you know, how do you, how'd you measure the 24 hours? Mm-hmm. So that's, that's part of the, you know, those that would lean toward this, part of what they would support, is it? Um, and then this, the, other, the other thing, and this one is actually a biggie to me, and he just kind of tucks it in there. The seventh day of creation marks the end of God's creative activity and is itself an eternal Sabbath rest, mm-hmm. not a 24-hour period. So in Hebrews, it talks about the, the Sabbath, that he's still on his Sabbath. So we know that the seventh day was a long day. It was a long period of time because it's still going on. So to me... Could the other six days have been long days? Yeah, it's possible. Okay, ask me. You're about to ask me. Well, this, this, you're saying that, that, that F says that God is still on His Sabbath rest that He took. Yeah. But God's very active in the world. He is, but but He that's how He that's how God describes it. It's in Hebrews. I don't I don't remember the reference, but um, that that He's He's in His rest. And uh, when it, you know, he rested from creation. That doesn't mean he, he that's right. quit doing anything. Okay, yeah, that's right. He did. That's you know, we're talking about retirement. Well, you know, yeah. I'm gonna, I'm, I'm <laughs> retiring from this. I'm not stopping life. No. <laughs> you know. See, I hope. One of the things that's fascinated me in reading the Bible uh-huh. is that God has. I don't see anywhere in the Bible after. The six days where God's created anything. Every time He's done something, He's worked with what He already created, all what He had. Okay. I I, I see that throughout. He does speak out Scripture. Oh sure. I mean that's that's new. Um, um, food fall from heaven. <laughs> food, yeah. Uh, and, but I, I hear you. I it's hear all what you're thought saying. out. His yeah. plan yeah. is... In terms of creation, I think it's, it, you know, we would all agree, the 24-hour people and the long day, we'd all agree that he did his, his creative activity yeah, in just, six days. That, being at, at Sabbath rest doesn't seem consistent with being active in 
using everything you've created. Well, maybe we should learn from that, though, um, that <laughs> Sabbath rest doesn't mean necessarily inactivity. Not doing anything. All right. It, means, okay. it might mean yeah. doing something different that, okay. you know, yeah. and... Is he delighting still in what he created? Yeah, and yeah, he is. Okay. Yeah. All right. And, that, yeah. Right. and when Christ came, that's it. Right, right. Good, good points, though. Mm -hmm. So, here's the thing. If, if I've just rocked your world, don't worry about it. Don't let that, you know, that, that this, I think, is a possibility. There are other positions as well. Yes? I, I'm, I'm with you, and having studied it also in that second period, and what was a big kicker for me was the, the text itself, because the sun doesn't come around until day four. It talks about light and darkness, and, but then, like, the, the greater to rule the day and lesser to rule the night is day four. And I was like... Well, maybe it wasn't 24 hours at least until then. You know what I mean? So, like, gave me some time. <laughs> right, because, like, the text itself has sun showing up day four, and so that was kind of a big thing for me to go, okay, maybe we can have broader yeah. periods of time, at least before, you know what I mean? Like, just... Yeah. Uh, well, I, I think that's a big argument, and, and that's... It, those are the kinds of things that kind of got me thinking, because, you know, before I ever studied any of this, if you'd asked me, I'd have said, of course it had to be 24-hour days. But, the, you know, when I figured out that, no, you can still believe the scripture, you can still believe his account and the order of his account, mm -hmm. and the days could have been longer, and that doesn't, that doesn't undercut scripture's authority one bit. So, anyway. Well, the order is the more, more important thing. Well, the, the order and uh, the other biggie, of course, is... Uh, uh, what we're going to move to now, and that is that God created man. Mm -hmm. And that was instantaneous. You know, it was not a, yeah. an evolution. Um, so that's, that's the other key. But that doesn't, uh, that doesn't affect the length of the day, God's no. creation of man. But there wasn't a period of gestation or anything. Nope. <laughs> nope. No nine months. No, right. well, you know, no mom. No <laughs> sonogram. Yeah, yeah. N none of that. And uh, God could do that. He can, you know, he can do what he wants with creation. So anyway, I, I just wanted you to be exposed to these. Again, don't, don't worry about it. Don't let it, you know, rock anyone's faith or anything. I'll talk with you more if it... If it if you're concerned about that. Once in a while, you know, somebody goes, whoa, you know, this is freaking me out. And, and it, it doesn't need to, but I, I understand that it may be something that you've never heard before, which is always rather concerning <laughs> when you're in a theology class. So, um, Okay, well, let's jump over and talk about uh, uh, man is created by God. Um, he uh, was created by God in his image. And uh, remember, after everything he did, uh, he said, it's good, it's good, it's good. Mm -hmm. And what I want to focus on is, uh, look on page 20. By the way, let me tell you a little bit about what's up here. Let's see. Let's at least start with this here. Creation, fall, redemption, and consummation. I wasn't sure if there was two M's, so I didn't want to misspell it for, you know, the videotape. So that's consummation there. Um, this is the flow of redemption history. And, and you, can, you can always see this. It starts with creation, then there was the fall, and then the history of redemption. Everything after the fall was moving somewhere. It's not a circular thing was moving toward redemption, as we'll see in a minute. And then when Christ comes back, that'll be the consummation. And it will be the new creation, okay? And it'll actually be, you know, as great as creation was, this will actually be better because there'll be no possibility for sin or fall again. So in that way, it'll be better. Okay? So just remember that in, in terms of the Scripture itself, it's a constant movement toward redemption, but ultimately toward when Christ comes back and makes everything right, makes everything new. 
justice will be done perfectly at that point. That's when we go, <sighs> the big, big deep breath that we say, all those frustrations will never be there again. Okay. All right. So, um, just one word at the bottom of 20, because I want you to know this term to the cultural mandate. Uh, if you ever read that in a theology book, um, uh, you might see that term. And that has to do with uh, man being created, and he is told that he is to um, take care of the earth, subdue the earth, have dominion over it, take care of it, be stewards of the earth. That's the cultural mandate. So in terms of ecology and things like that, we as Christians should be all about that. Now, we don't worship the earth. That's the difference. And, and sometimes those that, that we might agree with in terms of taking care of things aren't going to agree with us on, in those areas. But the other thing is we're told to fill the earth, too. And a lot of ecology people aren't all that thrilled about us fill this. Too many people already, you know. So, um, but we should have no problem with, you know, having a concern for our environment and so on. Uh, for Adam and Eve, they were to take care of the garden. That was their garden. This is our garden, okay? And it, it might be your house. That might be your what you, you're to take care of. But um, in the bigger picture, we are to take care of our world. So let's, let's at least start on, on the fall of man, and we're in Genesis uh, chapter 2. We see, it says in uh, uh, verse 15, the Lord God took the man, put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it, and the Lord commanded the man, saying, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in that day when you eat of it, you shall surely die. Now, remember what had already happened, and that is that um, each day God said it is good, you know, at the end of each day he said it is good, it is good, it is good, and then he, uh, so these are benedictions, good words he's pronouncing, and then he all of a sudden says, it's not good. Do you remember what was not good? For man to be alone. For man to be alone. Okay. So the first malediction, bad word, that he, he spoke was that, you know, that's, that's not the best for man. I mean, you know, and I, I, you know, from my perspective and maybe my warped imagination, I, I have to think of Adam kind of just going along saying, man, this is great. I'm naming animals, and I'm here. I've got everything I need, and so on. And God says, no, you really don't. There's something else. And so when we see uh, the, the creation of woman, it says this uh, down in verse 20. Uh, after he's naming all the livestock and the birds of uh, heaven and every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. Mm -hmm. So the Lord God uh, caused a deep sleep to fall on the man. We, we know how that worked. Uh, and uh, took the rib. And uh, verse 22, the rib that the Lord God had made, taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. And this is his reaction. I, I love this. He says, this is at last, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. Now he, whether he knew it or not up to that point, he knew it then. <laughs> you know, and, and it's like, if I don't want to add to scripture, but I picture it being like, wow. <laughs> okay. Yeah. This, this is different. You, you know, this is, uh, I, you know, thank you, God. And so, you know, here is all, let's not forget that, so Adam's like the king of creation, but creation wasn't complete until the woman. So she's the queen of all creation, 
but uh, that's that's the beauty there of God's God's plan. And uh, he says, "At last, is bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man." And then. Verse 24 is actually, these are the words of institution of marriage. Mm. Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife are both naked and not ashamed. So this one flesh is not just talking about a, a, you know sexually. It's, it's more than that, much more than that. Mm. Because that can take place between any two people. There's a difference between that and, and being one flesh. And uh, so that's, that's where they are. There's the two of them. And then we get into chapter 3. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say, uh, actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? <clears throat> now, did God say that? No, that's not what God said. So the answer could have been, no, that's not really what he said. But, um, so, but we see that's how Satan works. He's casting this doubt in there. He's twisting a little bit. And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of, of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Then it says, the serpent said to the woman, you shall not surely die. So here it goes from kind of questioning and putting a question in our mind to contradicting God. You won't die. For God knows that when you eat of it, uh, your eyes will be open, you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took its fruit and ate. She also gave some fruit to her husband who was with her, and he ate. So what we can see there is it's completely the woman's fault that sin came into the world. <laughs> then it says, what? what? Oh, 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 oh. what? Adam could have stopped it all along. Oh, <laughs> he was where there. was Adam anyway? <laughs> he said, right there, Adam was with her. And he, and You're exactly <laughs> right. Exactly. You don't have to convince me. I, she I, was fast. Yeah, you, you jumped all over that one. Like, don't walk out, ladies. Yeah, no, no, I'd, I'd, before they, they walked out. Well, but see, that's the thing. You know, a lot of people blame the woman and she didn't have faith and all that. The problem was the silence of Adam. He was right yeah. there. He had a job to do, and that was to take care and to protect and you know, and, and to, to speak up, to, you, you know, all of those things. It was his responsibility. In fact, what we, um, Adam is our federal head. He represented all mankind, all of his posterity after him. That includes us. He was the representative, and he fell. And so did so did Eve, but what was most serious was was him as our federal head. Now, someone might quickly say, "Well, that's not fair. You know, I, I wouldn't have done that if I was there." Oh, come on, you know. <laughs> but if you think having a federal head is not fair, understand that that was the first Adam. Mm -hmm. Who was the second Adam? Jesus Christ. He is the federal head of his people. And so he paid the price for what the first Adam did and what it means for all of us. That's why he is called the second Adam. And so, you know, if you want to cry out unfair that, that we have that one, I don't hear anybody crying unfair that Jesus died on the cross in our place. Mm -hmm. Because, and, and why does God do that? We don't know. He works through representatives. You go all the way through scripture and you see it again and again. You see um, the priesthood. They represent their people. You see the judges representing their people. You see the prophets, the kings, all representing their people. 
but all of them are pointing, you know, the kings are pointing who all fail in some way or another. They're pointing to a greater king mm -hmm. that is coming. So the, the prophet, priest, and king, you know, they're, they're all through the Old Testament where they're representing their people, and then we have Christ come, and he's the perfect prophet, priest, and king. He fulfills all of that. All right, you with me? Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's let's look at uh, what happened then. Um, let's see how far we're going to get tonight. We're doing pretty good, but I, we may have to do the very end of this next week. Um, so they fall. Um, I mean, they they fall into sin, mm -hmm. and. Then it says, uh, their eyes were both open, this is verse 7, uh, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. Okay, so, they, they find themselves with shame, basically. Mm. All right? And they did their best to fix their shame. Their best were leaves. <laughs> <laughs> that was the best they could come up with, okay? Which, I, I, I doubt that anyone in here has ever tried that, but I can't imagine it's very satisfactory if you're <laughs> embarrassed uh, that leaves would, would do much good. And so, um, they made themselves loincloths. Verse 8, And they heard the sound of the, of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. So here they go again. Okay, we can, we can fix it. We'll hide from him. <laughs> That'll work. Um, verse 9, But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? Do you think he didn't know? <laughs> I mean, really the question is, why are you hiding? Hiding and seeking. Yeah. All right. Yeah, okay, only, only in free. Yeah. And uh, verse 10, he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, I was afraid, because I was naked and I hid myself. He said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? And now here the, here's the second time the man steps up. Okay, here we go. The man said, the woman... Okay, starts with that. Whom you gave to me. So, you know, he's not only shifting it to his dear new, newly wed wife, um, but he's blaming her creator. Uh, she gave me the fruit of the tree, and all I did was eat. <laughs> and that's what, not exactly what it says, but uh, then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you've done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. Well, that's actually true, <laughs> um, but she's trying to shift it too, but she's actually telling the truth. Then God said to the serpent, and here's the curse. So when we talk about living under the curse, this is the curse. Because you've done this, cursed are you above all livestock. He's talking to Satan right now. All livestock above all the beasts of the field on your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. So the offspring of Satan would be he and his demons. Who's the offspring of the woman? Jesus. Yeah, all of us, and then ultimately Jesus, yeah. He shall bruise your head. This is uh, the offspring of the woman. And you shall bruise his heel. And you've heard this before, but the, 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 what's, what he's saying, you know, a, a bruise to the head, that's death. And you shall bruise his heel, that's not death. Mm -hmm. um, to the woman he said, I will surely multiply your pain. Before I leave that, I don't know if you all remember... Um, the movie The Passion of the Christ. Mm -hmm. Now, it, it was pretty accurate. I only saw it when I saw it the day it came out because I knew people would ask me about it. I only saw it once because I, you know, I didn't, don't, it's hard to watch. Mm -hmm. yes. and, um, and, and 
you know, and ultimately, as horrible as his pain was, that wasn't even his greatest pain. Mm -hmm. His greatest pain was that he was burying our sins on him, from the Father. He took all that away. But in that movie, there was one, there was a scene that I, I, I actually liked, and it was imagination, you know, but you, you keep seeing the snake, okay, uh, prior to the cross. And then in the garden, you see the snake again, and you see Jesus stomp on the snake. That's a reference to this. You know, he's, he's stepping on his head. Now, you know, if we were going to get technical, we'd say, well, he hadn't quite done it yet because he hadn't gone to the cross, but that's what he was doing. He, he was in the process of crushing Satan's head, which, by the way, He's still running around, isn't he? Oh, yeah. He knows the outcome, but he still fights, Satan does. He knows that he's doomed, but he still fights. He wants to take as many with him as he can. He thinks he can. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, then there's the curse on the woman, the pain in childbearing, and, and so on. Uh, to Adam, because you've listened to the voice of your wife. See there, God, he didn't pull anything over on God. You've eaten of the tree, which I command you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you, and so on. Um, we talked about those not that long ago, at least during Advent, I talked about the curse. Um, but uh, then, then look, uh, actually, I, yeah, I put Genesis 3.15. I'll put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. That's the promise of, that's the gospel right there. And everything from this moment on is, is going toward that to fulfill Genesis 3.15. Okay. So that's why you keep in mind, creation, fall, redemption, consummation. Um, Couple more things. The man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. Verse 21, the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. So remember what they had tried to do to take care of their shame? Leaves. Leaves, Leaves yeah. Uh, which, you know, wouldn't have worked. What we see is that, uh, you know, that was their best effort. That's, that's what happens when man tries to work his way to God. It's it, you know, you'll just get frustrated. You'll still have your shame. It's not going to take care of it. God gives them garments of skin and clothes them so that they aren't ashamed anymore. And show them there because he still loved them. He absolutely did. Mm -hmm. How do you get skin from an animal? Yeah, kill, kill the animal. animal. Yeah. Yeah. Shed its blood. And there we see, you know, that's the only thing that's going to take, take care of our shame, our sin, is the shedding of blood. And that's Christ. So already here, it's pointing toward, toward him. Comments, questions on this? Do you think all animals could talk pretty well? Could they talk? Could Adam and Eve communicate with all animals? I suspect they could. I, I think. I don't know that they talk like, like we think talking. Because I don't even. When you like, if, if a <laughs> snake showed up and you hadn't been in conversation with the other animals, you'd be like, "Why is this snake talking? Why is this one talking? And, and why is he telling me to do the one thing that I was told not to do?" Yeah, it's kind of like, that. Kind of makes you think that that wasn't that wasn't the unusual thing there, yeah. right? Uh, yeah. Wait, well, not that that matter. Isn't it the, this? Must be a yellow flag because an animal's talking. Yeah. You know, maybe I need to. No, that's that's an interesting point. Just like in Narnia. Yeah, <laughs> I would say at the very least they were communicating. Isn't it? Yeah, like because because um, kind of in the beginning when the serpent just came up and started talking to Eve, it almost hints at the fact that like they had talked before. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, oh, hey, Eve. Yeah. Right. By the way, she didn't yeah. say Adam. This <laughs> thing's yeah, talking. Yeah, she didn't say what the heck the serpent's talking. Yeah, yeah. And I, so, because he cursed the serpent and said, um, you know, you shall have to be on your belly. So does that mean like the serpent was probably it was a 
look completely different than what we would I, I, consider I think, as spanking. You know, we, we, we don't know for sure, but one would think. Yeah, I've, I've always thought that. Yeah. Like, it makes sense to me. Right. Because yeah, in movies like that, when you're, like, the, there's a few other movies that show the snake in, you know, visions and dreams and things, but, right. like, according to this, in the garden before the fall, the snake probably would have been, or the serpent. Yeah. Was he was like a, a serpent. He wasn't like a snake. Like a dragon. Yeah. Or yeah. yeah. And, there, and, and there was enmity, and, you know, I know some people love snakes, but I think, <laughs> A lot of us don't. <laughs> More people than not. There's a yes, that, fear, yeah. that's right. I, and I, you know, I always say that um, all snakes are deadly. It's just that some are poisonous. <laughs> also, you know, that's how I feel about snakes. But I know there there are good snakes. I see that on my next door neighborhood all the time when people are saying, "Is this snake deadly?" You know. But um, it's not like a puppy. Though. You're not gonna right. see a snake grow up there. Right, exactly. So um, <coughs> that's that's where we're headed, and next week we will uh, we'll go on to the person and work of Christ, and I, we have really flown tonight. So if if you think about things, feel free to start next week with questions because um, we've covered a lot of territory, but um, but. I think we got the main, the main stuff. Any other comments? In theology, fun. Mm -hmm. It's the best. Okay, let's pray. Lord, again, we are, uh, we're grateful. We, we thank you that you recorded for us what we need to know. And Lord, in the things we can't know, will you um, help us to have peaceful hearts and trust you with those things? But thank you most of all. Um, that, that uh, you have given redemption, you dealt with our shame, mm -hmm. and uh, that there will be a day when you make all things right, all things new. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm.